Today on The Divide, is there a fallback plan should Seattle's police staffing drop any lower? Really, my focus is making sure that my department is whole um, and being able to provide what we need to for the community. It's not a good thing that we've had police officers leave in such large numbers. And on the topic of policing, a relatable comparison that could help you understand why so many officers are leaving the profession. Plus, a three-term incumbent faces a new challenger in the race for King County Executive. People just want to see issues be solved, problems get fixed. I don't think people care if you're a Democrat or Republican so much as their life is getting better. That and more as we attempt to bridge the divide. Hello and welcome to The Divide and welcome to May. Thank you so much for joining us. The Seattle Police Department staffing crisis continues with no end in sight. SPD says it should have about 1,400 or so deployable officers to keep up with 911 calls. Well, right now they have 1,080. That as response times are already bad, even for life and death emergencies. And we, we all know what's going on here. Seattle has not been a supportive place for officers. And we know that that is why many officers are leaving because they write as much in their exit interviews. Let's uh, read a few of the uh, exit interviews from the latest officers to leave. This is literally them being asked, why are you leaving the department? This from an officer who left just in March. The pay is no longer worth the sacrifice and the strain on my family. Another from April, the hatred directed at SPD by our city leaders, activists, and the citizens of Seattle is unwarranted and unacceptable. Here is a, a letter from an officer who left in December to sign on just across the lake with the Bellevue Police Department. I'm looking forward to working with a department that has support from its city council. I think we got, let's do one more here. This is from an officer who retired uh, early in November. I was planning to stay one more year, but the way the city council has treated the men and women of this department is unconscionable. So what can be done? What can be done? I mean, we've been talking about this issue uh, for a while. It's ramped up certainly in the past year. But I spoke with interim Seattle Police Chief Adrian Diaz about this and how he can keep staffing levels from dropping any further while also dealing with the reality of the city's political climate. That feels like it's out of your control. Do you feel the same way? It, some of that is out of my control. But what is in my control is making sure uh, that my officers have the support uh, from the department, that we are giving them the tools, equipment, training, and the level of wellness to be able to go out and, and do the job. And that is within my control, and that is what I'm going to do. Um, and I know that some things of asking, you know, whether this is a political support, whether it, you know, it's from city leader. Really, my focus is making sure that my department is whole um, and being able to provide what we need to for the community. Yeah, but that's the thing is, uh, you know, I wonder whether you're getting to the point where you can't provide what you need to provide for the community. I mean, the most basic judgment of whether the department is able to do its job is response times. And we already know that response times have not been good, including for life or death emergencies. The response times are increasing. Yeah. So for you, 10,000 or 1,080 deployable officers, what is the threshold where you cannot provide the service that's needed to the community? I think right now what we've been doing is, is augmenting, uh, uh, you know, officers in different watches uh, to ensure that we are able to have safe amount of staffing uh, to, you know, to respond to 911 calls. But, and then that is one of the things that we're always looking at, but you don't want to, you don't want to have a, a a position where you're having to have officers work on an overtime basis just to maintain some level of safety. And, and I think right now we're in this, this level of, of trying to get our hiring up to, uh, up to speed and getting people into the door, but it takes time. And I think, you know, we're really on this race to making sure that uh, we've got several classes that are going to graduate sometime in the summer and then possibly be deployable in around October. And that will hopefully be able to replenish some of that. But you're hoping that you don't lose enough uh, by that time that you're able to replace uh, the people that you've lost. So, you know, it, it is a race of time. But I think, honestly, the other thing is just making sure that we have, we've got to be able to have staffing when it comes to each watch and each precinct. 
Look, you know, we've been talking about the staffing levels for some time now and the growing concern about that. I want to be honest about kind of worst case scenario. Is there a fallback plan if you do not have enough officers to adequately respond to life or death emergencies? I mean, do, do fellow agencies come help out, state patrol? There's got to be some sort of contingency. Yeah, I mean, I, I think right now, you know, I, I think this is all stuff that is managed in-house that I think we as a department can handle uh, the amount of officers that do leave, hoping that as if we don't have more officers leave uh, before we're able to get new officers in. Um, and so, like I said, it's kind of a little bit of a race, for, you know, race to that time. Uh, but I, I think that right now we do are looking at every level of contingency that we might need um, because you, you do have concerns. I think in Minneapolis, they did bring in agencies from outside the area to help patrol the streets and they, you know, created a budget for that. I, I don't think we're there yet. I do think that we have a staffing crisis, but I believe that uh, we can also manage it with, you know, making sure that we're augmenting, you know, the shift and making sure that our community response group is also available to, to be able to respond to 911. And then we have other units that are also able to assist from our traffic, which are our motor units and some other different specialized units. You know, you're very diplomatic, uh, and I, th I think that's probably just in your nature. You're just a nice man. Um, but, you know, there's also the reality that you are the interim chief. Mayor Jenny Durkin has already said she's going to let the next mayor uh, help in the, the search for a permanent chief, uh, and the city council has a say in that. Um, is it still a job that you want? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, I think... It, you know, this was this question comes up quite regularly uh, as serving as a chief at a major city. Uh, last year, I think we had 33 major city chiefs uh, that were replaced. Um, and so I always say we're, we're all interim chief. Uh, our focus is, my, at least for me, my focus is really making sure that, you know, we've created calmness in the department. We've reset our consent decree. We've revamped our, our, um, uh, our crowd management response. We are, you know, continuously pushing on driving down our shots fired and being able to address the homicides. And I feel like we have great men and women that I would love to lead. I would love to continue this job. Uh, it, it's, it's really up to the community and up to the people that if they would allow me to do it. But if you didn't have that specter <laughs> of, you know, a, a job interview, basically, or that desire for that job, hanging over your head would your tone on the city council be different no this is this, this is me um, you're just a nice man <laughs> nice people don't make good tv chief i, I know i know but you know <laughs> i you know for me it's really just you know i think we have a lot of challenges and i think that we uh, as a community we always find you know we've always had this level of div division and you know i i look at you know even from working in youth work uh, you know, I've watched people just find ways to dehumanize people and, and find ways to, to create these divisions. And, and for me, like, in order for, like, successful partnerships to occur, I've got to find ways that we work across lines, even though we might have disagreements, but I've got to figure out how we work across those lines to, to end up, at the end of the day, saving people's lives. And so, you know, that's just kind of my nature. Um, but, uh, and, and, Honestly, I love this work. I love the city, and I and I and I keep on saying that, but nothing has changed. You know, I you know it's it is a hard job. Don't get me wrong. This is I don't think anybody could expect to be uh, the chief in Seattle and think that it's an easy job. I mean, long hours, um, but I think it's actually to me it's it's uh, I feel like we're making a great impact in people's lives. Well, bridging the divide is a really good note to end on for the show. <laughs> yeah, and I'm kidding. Nice people do make good TV. This is the divide. We want to bridge the divide. So maybe we need to have more nice people on. Uh, but look, you know, Chief Diaz said we were chatting um, about, you know, some of the things that maybe could be done. How do we how do we get through this, this phase? He said one of the things that would help would be reinstituting a signing bonus for officers who come here from other agencies. Those are called laterals. I spoke with Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin about that and the other incentives that are being considered. We are looking at a range of things. The chief and I meet every week. And one of the topics that we discuss every week is what's the status of our workforce. How many people have left? How many have we recruited? How many are coming back? 
Um, and we're looking at a range of options, including, you know, are there some incentives we can give people who are in the workforce, who we want to stay, but who've had just a tremendously difficult year? What can we do to get people to stay? Um, and second, if they can bring somebody as a recruit that's the kind of officer we want, can we give them some kind of incentive as well, as well as whether there's some incentive for lateral uh, pay for people to come here. Local jurisdictions are doing that. We're looking at the data to see if last time we did it, it helped us. Um, but we're, we will, we're looking at a whole range of tools right now. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's really important that the budgets for SPD not be decreased and people not look at the um, fact that officers have left as savings. Um, it's not savings. It's not a good thing that we've had police officers leave in such large numbers and larger than we can recruit officers in. On you know some of these options that you've weighed with the chief, you know maybe being able to give incentives to officers who are already here or giving um, those lateral bonuses to get officers from other agencies. Just um, for the edification of viewers, who has to sign off on that? Is it just you or is it the city council? No, the city you? council would have to prove it in a budget action. Do you see that uh, as a likely scenario, given the fact that they've been cutting and chipping away at the budget? Look, I, I'm hopeful that if we can come with a comprehensive plan that shows what we need to do and how it'll be effective, but we also have to tie it to other workplace things. Um, the chief has also been looking at, is there a way we can change? You know, For years, we've been looking, can we have four tens? shifts so that officers get certainty and predictability on their days off? Um, are there other things that we can do just in the workplace and wellness conditions that we have total control of? So we wanna look at all of those tools. And I think at number one though, it starts with what you and I've talked before is that every officer has to understand their job is important. The people of Seattle need them, they're appreciated. Yeah, and to give uh, credit where credit is due on that front, President Biden earned a standing ovation for this line right here during his address to Congress this week. The vast majority of men and women wearing a uniform and a badge serve our communities and they serve them honorably. I know them. I know they want... To Yeah, and look, words do matter. And it's not too late for leaders to change the words they use, to be less divisive, to be more intentional, and to understand, as President Biden said, the vast majority of officers are here to serve. Acknowledging that does not preclude you from pushing for reform. Uh, and by the way, you can catch more of my interview with the interim police chief coming up tomorrow on The Divide podcast, so make sure to download and subscribe. And I will have a few more thoughts on this topic to close the show today. But first, coming up after the break, the race for King County Executive just got more interesting as Dow Constantine faces what will be perhaps his most difficult challenge to date. Stick around. King County has had the same elected leader for more than a decade, and Executive Constantine would like to stick around a little bit longer. He's running for a fourth term this year, but a new challenger has entered the race from the same side of the political aisle. It's been 16 years since King County was renamed after Martin Luther King Jr., and I believe it's time to live up to our namesake. It's time for us to fight for what we believe in. My name is Joe Wynn, and I'm running for King County Executive. State Senator Joe Wynn there in his campaign announcement, uh, announcing his candidacy. He might look familiar because you've probably seen him on this show before, talking about issues like uh, the tax on capital gains, which is something he supported. Wynn and I spoke about his campaign and his decision to take on one of the state's top progressive politicians. Is it considered um, taboo to challenge an incumbent who's of the same party as you and really someone whose politics aren't vastly different than your own? Yeah, that's what I hear. You know, it's funny, my uh, experience is not necessarily within the party per se. I've done a lot of work in the community and my background is actually in the private sector. So I'm more focused on just getting things done. And I care very little about the politics associated with it. And that's kind of why I get in trouble here and there for doing things that isn't quite up to decorum, but at the same time, when people are in need, you're supposed to help them. That's what I was taught when I was growing up. So yeah, I think there's a lot of energy behind this one because you don't often see 
D on D races, especially with two very serious candidates. But in my mind, you know, if you're in a position to serve, right, like my family growing up in unincorporated King County, the only reason why we were able to be successful is because we had the support from the community. We had access to opportunities that helped us uh, become stable and become whole. And I want to be able to give that back to people right now as well. So uh, King County Executive is a job that I think a lot of people kind of misunderstand. Yeah. Um, what, what for you in this role do you believe are, are the most important fundamental jobs of the executive? I mean, beyond the actual role itself, it's the, the glue that holds things together, right? Like the homelessness issue should be solved within King County because it is a regional approach. Everything from transit, even police accountability, criminal justice, all of those things are within King County. And really what I think we need are leaders who come from within the community and lead with community, not just out in front. It was very eye-opening. So there were a couple of jurisdictions that made decisions about homelessness that I didn't agree with. So I decided to give them a call instead of just flaming them online, um, because I think that's what I think a lot of folks may have done. And it was just eye-opening to see that like there was some distrust, um, the process didn't quite work out for them, the engagement wasn't quite there. And so many times uh, in the legislature and outside where picking up the phone and making a phone call to somebody that you don't agree with oftentimes comes to a pretty good resolution. And you send a tweet out, but like that's why I think my counterparts on the other side of the aisle um, respect me is because even when I disagree with them, we have these honest conversations. We've had some pretty tough but good honest conversations this past session, and I don't shy away from talking to people that I don't don't agree with. And that's how we can move forward is building trust and respect for one another. You and I have, just in full disclosure, we've talked a lot offline about, I think, the state of politics. And, yeah. you know, I think frustrations sometimes with how politicians operate, maybe not honestly. Um, and I have heard from Republicans, and I put this out there on Twitter after you announced your candidacy, that there's a lot of Republicans in Olympia who like working with you, uh, even though I don't know that they agree with you on a single issue. Yeah. Uh, but they just feel like you don't BS them, which I think that they appreciate. And I look at um, that in the context of the job you're seeking. You know, King County and, and the role is interesting because you're probably, you are more closely aligned with the politics of Seattle than a lot of parts of unincorporated King County. Yeah. So talk to those viewers for me who live in um, unincorporated parts of King County who are not going to agree with you politically on just about anything. You know what's interesting in the legislature, 80 to 90 percent of our bills are, are in fact bipartisan. So the vast majority of the things that we do are in fact bipartisan. And honestly, good governance is not a partisan issue. So we've been able to find a lot of common ground in terms of what we work on that just uplifts one another. We all want to see a state and a county that is going to be set up for success so that our kids have an opportunity to succeed as well. How we get to that point may not be the exact same way, but I think our end goal is the same. And you'd be surprised at the number of times where I was working on a, a, a piece of legislation on police arbitration, what was seemingly very contentious spent hours and hours and hours talking to all types of stakeholders from law enforcement to my colleagues across the aisle. And we came up with a solution to everything, uh, to something that we thought was a problem and it ended up passing in a very bipartisan way. So for the most part, people just want to see issues be solved, problems get fixed. I don't think people care if you're a Democrat or Republican so much as their life is getting better. So if you're able to show your, your worth as a leader and getting things done, I think that's what people care about, right? Like I am very clear about my positions on, you know, say for instance, gun safety. There was a constituent in my district that was having some issues getting his concealed license permit. I made a call for him, he got it, and he was very happy. And he was, based off of the conversation we had, was probably not somebody in my target demographic, right? So I think people just want to make sure that their voices are being heard, their issues are being addressed, and that their leaders are actually working for them. You know, there is some frustration with um, the election for King County Executive because Seattle picks the executive. That's just the way it is. That's where the population is based. But Seattle yeah. has a mayor. You know, Seattle has a police department, yet they get to weigh in on someone who is in charge of unincorporated parts of the county who are so, you know, even in the same county, so different um, than Seattle. Do you understand that frustration that Seattle voters get to pick a mayor and a county executive? I do. In the legislature, it is definitely a theme that I hear from people as it relates to, um, you know, that dynamic. But Seattle is also the economic engine of this entire state. 
you know, the Puget Sound uh, area in Seattle and King County sends about a billion dollars in taxes to other parts of the state as well. So they certainly should have a say. Um, and just to be clear, I'm actually from White Center originally, unincorporated King County. So uh, I work with a lot of the community members and leaders there as well. And there's certainly frustrations about that dynamic. So I, I feel like I understand um, that space a little bit. And having, you know, talked to our leaders in suburban areas, across the county as well. There's certainly an angst as it relates to how resources and things get allocated. And that's one of the things that we should be addressing is that we should be talking and reaching out more to communities that have been underinvested in the past. Uh, and that's how we move forward together. And you can hear more of my interview with Senator Joe Wynn coming up tomorrow on the Divide podcast. Hear what he's looking for in the next sheriff if he's elected King County Executive. And also his thoughts on Dow Constantine's controversial comments about closing the downtown Seattle jail. And speaking of Executive Constantine, I will be sitting down with him for next week's episode. So stay tuned for that. All right, coming up after the break. Why it is hard to blame Seattle police officers for leaving the agency or maybe the profession altogether. Stick around. I was looking through the latest exit interviews from officers who have left the Seattle Police Department uh, recently, and one of them in particular caught my eye. It was written by an officer who decided to retire back in November. The reason that officer lifts, listed for leaving some of the decisions made by city leadership have led to hostile and unsafe working conditions. This type of treatment and lack of respect would not be tolerated for any other profession. And that, it just struck me because I think it puts the Seattle Police Department staffing crisis in terms that every single one of us can understand and can empathize with. Imagine that you are at the top of your profession you get paid more than most of the people who do your job. It sounds great, right? Now let's see how much you'd be willing to put up with for that salary. Let's say that your boss is kept threatening publicly to lay you off based on the color of your skin. Is that a job that you would stay in? Let's say your boss is suggested outsourcing your job to people with a fraction of your qualifications. Is that a company that you would keep working for? Let's say people came to your place of work and lit it on fire with you inside, and then your boss has acted like it was no big deal. Is that a place that you'd want to go back to? Let's say that you were working and someone told you in front of one of your bosses that you should kill yourself. And your boss didn't say anything, didn't stand up for you. Is that a boss that you would keep working for? We're out here fighting for the ability SPD. for people to breathe. I need you to do me a favor. That is Take your doing. guns, put them under your chins, and pull the trigger. This isn't a response. So I go back to that officer's exit interview. This type of treatment and lack of respect would not be tolerated for any other profession. Not a single one of us would tolerate that kind of treatment at work. And in fact, it is shocking to me that some of these officers haven't sued the city after leaving. Any private corporation would be buried in litigation. So while yes, it is a crisis for the police department to be so short staffed, I cannot in good faith blame a single officer who decides to leave. I'll see you tomorrow on Q13 News This Morning.